If anyone didn't work well, they would yell. If you said you were sick, they never believed it, and you had to keep working. It was only when someone had a cut on the leg from a machete or something else that they could see bleeding that they would let you stop working. We were there for 11 months. At the end of the time, we got bikes. We had to find the path to get home. The guy who showed us had to be paid. It took nine days to get home, and we could only eat some days because of people of goodwill in Benin. I decided to talk to the customers who came to the market to see if they could help me. Finally, a boy told me that he would take me back to Togo if I would marry him. I was desperate, so I said yes just to get out. Now my brothers are working hard in the fields to pay off that boy so I don't have to marry him. I'm back living with them, and I'm in an apprenticeship again for hairdressing. The boss there lets me make some money sometimes, pounding and selling fufu. Everyone eats chocolate. Of 4.5 million cocoa plantations around the world, over 40% of world cocoa is produced by slave labor. 70% of world cocoa production is located on the western coast of Africa. This locality produces 2.6 million tons per year. 1.5 million are produced on the Ivory Coast and Ghana alone. The cocoa industry is neither safe nor equitable for the workers. Child labor and forced labor are often exploited but there are efforts to help. Fair trade is defined as an organized social movement and market-based approach that aims to help producers in developing countries obtain better trading conditions and promote stability. It advocates the payment of higher prices to producers, as well as sets social and environmental standards. The fair trade movement is significant because of its tremendous impact on the moral, political, and economic aspects of international society. There seems to be a connection between violent civil conflict and slavery, which is avoided by governments to maintain the profit of companies. The nation's political reliance on export taxes, as well as socio-economic reliance on child slave labor, has led to a lack of infrastructure, corrupt government, and a lack of representation in international determinants of cocoa pricing, which prevent the stabilization and modernization of the nation. Failed attempts at global legislation include the Bouquet Agreement, ILO's Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work, the Harkin Engel Protocol, as well as the North American Free Trade Agreement. The vicious cycle of minimal enforcement mentioned at the Global Alliance Against Forced Labor starts by emphasizing the lack of clear legislation. Secondly, there are little or no resources for prosecution. Therefore, there is limited awareness and publicity. The cycle repeats because there is no pressure for clear legislation. Prominent non-government organizations, such as International Labor Organization, the United Nations Children's Fund, Anti-Slavery International, and the World Trade Organization have begun lobbying for this cause. Conventions have been held by these non-government organizations in order to reduce the presence of forced labor and child labor. These conventions, or calls to action, are not limited to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and ILO's Convention Concerning the Prohibition and Immediate Action on the Worst Forms of Child Labor. As of 2006, one in six children, or 158 million children, ranging from 5 to 14 years old, work in farms and are considered child laborers. According to the U.S. Department of State, there are more than 109,000 of these children in the Ivory Coast cocoa industry, working under the worst forms of child labor. On top of that, over 10,000 are victims of human trafficking or enslavement. These children come from poverty-stricken families who depend on their children as a source of income. As a result, they come to the farms looking for a better life, which is what most human traffickers promise to coax the children to come work on the farms. The children agree to work on the farms for $180 a year. However, they realize soon after they have started to work that they will be paid much less than they were promised that year or they will not be paid at all. The child labor laws already in place are ineffective, resulting in unlimited work hours for children starting at the age of 12 when school is not in session. In Ghana and the Ivory Coast, 80% of child laborers carry dangerous heavy loads, while 57% use machetes. Cocoa farmers often do not receive a fair price for their cocoa. 
They can be subject to scams by middlemen, making their already difficult lives worse. Many chocolate companies reap the benefits, making millions of dollars while giving little or no thought to the conditions on the cocoa farms. The cocoa produced goes through multiple steps before reaching the chocolate companies. Intermediaries pay farmers one euro per kilo of cocoa beans. From there, they are cleaned, sorted, and packed. National exporters then sell the beans for 2.5 euros per kilo. Companies buy the cocoa and turn it into chocolate. One kilo of cocoa beans can be made into 40 chocolate bars. These chocolate bars sell for 80 euro cents per bar or 32 euros collectively. The world price of cocoa is mainly determined by London Financial Futures Exchange and the Intercontinental Exchange. Chocolate companies often buy the cheaper, non-fair trade cocoa over the certified sources in order to make more of a profit. But with the recent publicity concerning the inhumane conditions on the cocoa farms, many companies are being pressured into becoming fair trade certified. Most fair trade organizations started in the mid to late 1900s as missionary projects, social rights movements, or political statements. One of the first fair trade efforts was started by Edna Ruth Byler. After a trip to Puerto Rico in 1946, Byler began to sell handcrafted products in the United States in order to open a marketplace for artisans in developing countries. Thirty years later, Byler's business became 10,000 Villages, a volunteer-run store that pays artisans fair prices for their products. In 1990, the European Fair Trade Association was officially recognized as a group of 10 fair trade importers throughout nine European countries. In 1992, the Fair Trade Foundation was established as an independent nonprofit that licenses the use of the fair trade mark on products in the UK that meet fair trade standards. And in 1997, the Fair Trade Labeling Organization was created, with its primary mission to set and coordinate international standards for the labeling of fair trade products. For example, fair trade promotes farmers in obtaining equitable returns on their chocolate and allowing local economies to flourish, encouraging the development of schools and transportation and greatly improving daily life. Some money goes to improvements in the localities of the farmers. $125 million was given to these places in 2002 and to 2010. It increased 15% from 2008 to 2009. Fair trade has had far-reaching influences. 1.2 million producers are involved in fair trade. According to Katie Barrow from Fairtrade USA in an interview conducted via email, Fairtrade standards prohibit forced child labor. Regular audits help ensure that farmers are in compliance. If child labor is found during the audit, the farm would not pass. They are then given the opportunity to take steps to correct the problem by creating a plan of action to educate members about the standards and cease the use of forced child labor. If the problem is not corrected, cooperatives risk the chance of being decertified. Children are permitted to help out on their parents' farms as long as it is not during school hours or they are not doing dangerous tasks. In Ghana, for example, Historically, child labor has been a huge problem. We find that fair trade and cocoa co-ops are building schools, creating scholarship funds, and sending kids on to high school and on to college. In Rwanda, we find communities that have invested in clean water and women's health. In addition, fair trade mandates that no harmful chemicals can be used on the farm. In conclusion, not only has fair trade changed the political, economic, and moral aspects of society's thinking, but it fights for the farmers as well. Fair trade fights for the rights of the farmers in respect to their treatment, choices about labor, and economic market fairness. Though the rights of the farmers were infringed upon by those who exploit them, fair trade works along with those who support the cause through buying to give them a better life. Those who exploit the farmers are not fulfilling their responsibilities as both human beings and employers to give the workers the quality of life they need and deserve. It then becomes a responsibility responsibility of fair trade and the public to support these farmers.